Hello everyone and welcome back. Today and tomorrow we're going to be talking about systems of differential equations, which is a collection of two or more related differential equations. Systems of differential equations are used to represent situations when you have two related quantities, both of which are changing simultaneously, and you want to represent that situation. Today, our goal is just to give some examples of some real-world scenarios which can be represented by a system of ODEs. One example of a situation that can be represented by a system of differential equation is the idea of a radioactive series or a radioactive decay chain. In some situations, when you have a radioactive substance which is decaying, it transforms into another substance which also in radioactive decay. For example, if you look at the uranium decay chain for uranium-238, uranium-238 decays into thorium-234, which decays into another radioactive substance and into another and into another, and so on and so forth, until finally it decays all the way to lead-206. So if I wanted to represent a situation like this one, I might use a quantity, maybe y sub 1, as a function of time to represent the amount of uranium-238 I might use y sub 2 to represent the amount of thorium-234 and so on and so forth until finally I got until finally I got to maybe y sub 15 of t which would represent the amount of lead 206. Now, if I were going to set up a differential equation representing this situation, I might start by looking at the rate of change of uranium-238 over time. Because uranium-238 is in radioactive decay, it's decaying exponentially. So the rate of change of uranium is going to be proportional to the amount of uranium that you currently have. And I'm going to go ahead and emphasize with a negative sign that the constant in this equation would be a negative number. Negative to represent that y prime is going to be negative because the amount of uranium is decreasing. Now simultaneously, as the uranium's amount is changing as a result of decay, the thorium amount is changing as a result of its decay. The thorium is changing at a rate which is proportional to the amount of thorium that you currently have. So y2 prime would be equal to some negative constant multiplied by y2 itself. However, the amount of thorium is increasing so I'll write plus some constant, is increasing as the uranium decays and transforms into thorium. So I would have a positive term in the y2 prime equation, which represents the amount of thorium gained as the uranium transforms into thorium. and so on and so forth. If I wanted to set up a differential equation for protactinium, then I would have maybe a y3 prime is equal to some negative constant multiplied by the amount of protactinium that we have, plus some positive constant multiplied by the amount of thorium, which is decaying into protactinium and so on and so forth. So in this case, we would use a system of differential equations to simultaneously represent the changes of the amounts of all these interrelated quantities. What are prey systems? In our very, very first video of the course, we looked at how predator-prey systems represent a situation that can be modeled using differential equations. In this case, we have two quantities, x and y. x represents the population of a prey species at time t, 
and y represents the population of a predator species, also at time t. Now if I look at the rate of change of the prey species over time, then the prey species is growing exponentially. So it would be equal to some positive constant multiplied by the amount of that species at time t. However, the population of prey decreases whenever the prey and the predator encounter each other and the predator eats one of the members of the prey species. So there is a negative term, a term with a negative coefficient, multiplied by yx, because y times x represents the amount of interaction between the prey and the predators. As you have more prey, as you have more predators, in either case, the amount of potential interaction between those two groups goes up. Now simultaneously, the predators benefit whenever predator and prey interact. So there is a positive term, a term with a positive coefficient, containing x times y. But because the members of the predator population are in competition with each other for the same resources, there's generally a term with a negative coefficient in the back, minus d times y, which reflects the fact that, yeah, you need a few predators around in order for reproduction to occur, but generally if there are too many predators, there's too much competition for the same resources, and that overall will harm the population's growth. So this would be another situation that could be represented by a system of differential equations. Our two related quantities are the two populations uh, of predator and prey, both of which are changing over time. You can also use a system of differential equations to represent the relationship between two species which are not in competition with the other members of their same species, but are in competition with the members of the other species. For example, perhaps both of these species would do very well if they were alone in their environment positive number times x, positive number times y, to represent exponential growth if left alone. However, the presence of the other population, uh, as the other population increases, the other population is consuming more and more resources, which harms the first population. Each species is benefited by the presence of the members of its own population, but is harmed by the presence of members of the other population. Electrical networks, so if you have a, a circuit which contains a branching path, for example, something like what we have here in the circuit diagram in this picture, that can also be represented by a system of differential equations. So in this diagram, we have a voltage source represented by E in this circle. And that voltage source is inducing a current in this circuit. That current is called I1. Now the current hits a branching point at the location called B sub 1, and the current splits into two. The current I1 gets split into I2, which is going along the path toward B2 here, and the current I3, which is going off to the right side. So we're going to set up now two different differential equations, one which represents the voltage along this loop in red, and another which represents the voltage along this outer loop in green. Now using some of the laws for circuits, you can find that 
if you take the impressed voltage along the red loop, then that's going to be equivalent to I1 times R1, the voltage drop as the current I1 moves across the resistor labeled R1, plus L1 times the derivative of I2 over time, that's the voltage drop across this inductor labeled L1, and then I2 multiplied by R2, that's the voltage drop across this resistor labeled R2 down here. Using the circuit laws, you can also find that the impressed voltage is the same thing as what you get by taking I1 times R1 and then adding that to I3 times, excuse me, L2 times the derivative of I3 with respect to time, that's the voltage drop over this inductor in the far right here. Full stop, because on the green loop, we don't encounter any other components on our way back to the voltage source labeled E. So currently, this system of three equations would describe the behavior of the current in this system. If you wanted to, you could simplify this a little bit by plugging in I2 plus I3, wherever I1 appears in the equations below. So that way you would only have a system of two equations containing two output variables, I2 and I3. So circuits with branching paths are another situation that can be represented using a system of differential equations. Our good friend, the mixing tank problem can also be represented uh, using systems of differential equations. So let's go ahead and let's do an exercise of actually setting up such an equation. So we've got two mixing tanks now, tank A and tank B, hooked up according to what you see in this picture here. Now we're told that initially tank A contains 50 gallons of water in which 25 pounds of salt is dissolved. Tank B contains 50 gallons of pure water in the beginning. So if X sub A represents the pounds of salt in tank A, and X sub B represents the pounds of salt in tank B, let's set up a system of differential equations describing this entire scenario. Okay, now tank A initially contains 50 gallons of water. Five gallons of pure water is going into the tank every minute. One gallon of the mixture from tank B is also going into tank A. And five gallons of water of the mixture of tank A is also going out. So it looks like the fluid going into tank A is always exactly equal to the fluid coming out of tank A and therefore the amount of fluid in tank A is constant at 50 gallons at all times. Simultaneously for tank number B, we have one gallon uh, coming in in total, and we have one plus three gallons of liquid going out in total. So tank B started with 50 gallons of liquid, and because the amount of liquid going out is an exact match, to the amount of liquid going in, the amount of liquid in tank B will always remain the same. So having established that, let's now try and set up some differential equations for the rate of change of the amount of salt in tank number A and the amount of change in the amount of salt in tank number B. And as always, we're going to use our basic setup Let's figure out how much salt is coming in in total and how much salt is coming out. Now let's look at the fluids which are coming in to tank number A. The pure water coming into tank number A is not contributing any salt whatsoever. However, the mixture coming in from tank number B may be contributing some salt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the flow rate of the mixture coming into tank A and multiply it by its concentration. 
So what is the concentration, the mixture coming in from tank B? The concentration is always equal to the amount of salt in tank B divided by the amount of fluid in tank B, which we found was equal to 50 gallons, the amount of fluid. Now, meanwhile, the salt coming out of the tank can be found by multiplying the flow rate of the fluid by the concentration of the fluid. And the concentration can once again be found by looking at the amount of salt, this time in tank number A, called X sub A, and dividing it by the amount of fluid in tank A. Now simultaneously, if I look at the rate of change of the amount of salt in the tank called B, once again we can do an analysis of the salt in versus the salt out. Now where could salt be coming into this tank? The salt could only be coming into this tank from the fluid that is getting pumped in from tank number A. So let me take the flow rate of the fluid from tank A and multiply it by the concentration of the salt in the fluid in tank A. The flow rate is four and the concentration is Xa, the amount of salt, divided by the amount of fluid. Now what's the salt coming out of tank B? The salt is coming out from two different sources. The salt is coming out via this pipe that is feeding back into tank A, and it's also coming out from this pipe here on the bottom right. So if I look at the fluid going back into tank A, the flow rate is one gallon per minute, and the concentration is the amount of salt in tank B divided by the amount of fluid in tank B. If I look at the mixture coming out of the pipe on the bottom right, in this case the flow rate would be three, and the concentration would still be the amount of salt divided by the amount of fluid. So after a little bit of simplification and a little bit of cleaning, this is what we find. This system of differential equations could be used to represent the mixing tank given in the diagram. That concludes today's material. Today we defined a system of differential equations and we examined a couple of quintessential situations that a system of differential equations could be used to represent. Tomorrow we'll talk about a technique that can be used to solve differential equations such as the one that we just set up for the two mixing tanks.